Open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Let's read together starting in verse 5. This is the message that we heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, some of the most interesting things you'll hear, you'll hear at church. Gus Nichols has an interesting story. It was in a sermon about if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. He said he was visiting a church and the guy got up to do the Lord's Supper thoughts and prayed a prayer. Lord, forgive us of our many, many sins. And then he took the bread and went row by row to the back and came back to the front and then prayed, Lord, forgive us of our many, many sins. And then took the fruit of the vine down each row all the way back to the front. Lord, forgive us of our many, many sins. And then passed the collection plate. And Gus said, I was wondering what in the world were they doing back there? <laughs> you know, you pray, forgive us of our sins. Five seconds later, you feel the need to ask for forgiveness again. He was trying to make the point that when you ask forgiveness, believe it takes. And that's a good point. I was sitting in the audience on a Wednesday night, and the church was engaged in a study of this book, 1 John chapter 1. And the speaker was talking about how great it is that God forgives us when we ask forgiveness. After all, he's our father. And then he said, but now suppose that there's a deacon who on a whim, he's on a business trip in New Orleans and he has a, a moment of weakness and he ends up in the backseat of his car with somebody he's not married to. The next day he's driving back home and he comes to a curve in the road and it's a dangerous curve and there's a semi coming the other way and he doesn't see each other and they hit and he loses his life. What do you think God will do to that man? And I will never forget the elder sitting two rows from the back who yelled out, he's a goner for sure. Uh, hmm. I was just a kid when I went on a door knocking campaign. We were supposed to knock on a door. And then when somebody answers the door, we're supposed to invite them to worship services on Sunday. One of my first doors I knocked on, I was just a kid. I show the guy the pamphlet and he looks at it and he says, Church of Christ, aren't you guys the ones who think you're the only ones going to heaven? I had never heard that before. So I went back to the guy in charge of the group and I said, what am I supposed to say when someone says that? And he looked me straight in the eye and he said, tell him, not all of us are going to make it. <laughs> True story. There's a preacher who was laying on his deathbed being comforted by his son, who was also a preacher. He had spent his entire life telling people about the gospel of Jesus. And as he lay on his deathbed, tears rolling down his face, he confessed to his son, I am scared to death that I haven't done enough. These stories resonate with me because I've heard stories like this all my life. I have felt this most of my life. And if you can relate to any of this, I want to share with you some good news tonight. When I was growing up, I thought to walk in the light meant always doing the right thing. To walk in darkness is to mess up. Couple that with a verse that says, if you confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us our sins. And together, you have all the ingredients one needs to create what I like to call a spiritual neurotic. One definition of sin is missing the mark. So I assumed that if I failed to hit the mark, 
then I was not in the light. I was in the darkness. Once I realized I've fallen into darkness, well, then I could ask forgiveness and God would put me back in the light again. But then every time an unkind thought would enter my head while driving behind someone driving too slow, which still happens. And every time I get angry or impatient, these are sins, you know. I was right back in darkness until such a time as I became aware of my need for confession and then God would make me right again. So all day long, I was in grace and out of grace, in grace and out of grace, in grace, then out of grace. Let's make the story worse. There are sins of commission. That's when you do something wrong that he said not to do. But then there's sins of omission. That's when you fail to do something that he told you to do. And the more I became aware of God's standard of righteousness, the more glaring my failings became. And I kind of quit saying, how often have I done wrong today? And started asking, did I ever do anything actually right today? And if the Lord came back during the first 30 seconds after I went to God in prayer, then I was home free. But anything after that was questionable. And the only way not to die in my sins was to die in my streak of sinlessness for the five minutes after I prayed. I want to share with you three things in this story, in this passage, that I hope will be of encouragement if you've ever felt that way. First, John seems to be referring to a confessional life more than just confessional moments. In the same breath, John can say he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And he can also say, if we say we have no sin, we lie. And the truth is not in us. Now, who's the we John's talking about? He's either talking about himself and his first century readers or the whole Christian church or anyone who reads the letter. But regardless, he means to include people who claim the name of Christ. That means that there really is no time of day when a Christian can honestly say, me? Oh, I don't have anything going on in my life that I need God to work on. I don't have anything less than the full character of Christ in my mind and heart. My sanctification is so complete that I don't need to claim Christ's righteousness. I've got my own to stand on. In fact, if there's ever a moment when I think I do have that, that's the moment when I need to realize I don't have that. Isaiah says that on our best day, our righteousness is like filthy rags. Isaiah 64 and verse 6. Even the Apostle Paul, who was so close to God, years of prayer and spirit-led preaching and living, years of missionary work, beatings, torture, imprisonment, says in Philippians chapter 3, not that I've already attained, but I press on to the goal. And what's the goal? A perfect life where I can show my righteousness card to God and say, wow, haven't I got it all figured out? And he'll say, you sure did. No, Paul says the goal is to be found in him, not having a righteousness that is my own, but that which comes through the faith of Christ. This is why we lie when we say, I have no sin. I don't have periods of safety during the day because I have confessional moments that add up. I'm in constant need, constant need of his divine presence and power and forgiveness. And as a Christian, you and I live a confessional life, one that in word and deed shows a recognition that I don't have what it takes, but I trust in Jesus's blood, the father's promise and the spirit's work in my life. The second thing I want you to notice is the phrase walking in the light. The term walk is a borrowed term from the Old Testament. It's a Hebrew idiom. We still use it today in the sense that he means it. When someone talks about your walk of life, they're not talking about how you step. They're talking about the way of life you lead. Think of the first psalm. 
Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. For John, there are two ways of life you can choose. The way of life, the way of light, and the way of darkness. In fact, in the Gospel of John, John chapter 11, Jesus says, If anyone walks in the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Can you see this isn't talking about how perfectly straight you walk. It's talking about the environment in which you walk. So repeatedly in the gospel, John says that Jesus is the light of the world and those who follow Jesus do not walk in darkness. Those who don't know Christ, those who have never named the name of Christ, no matter how many good deeds they do, their walk is in darkness. Their walk is not in Christ. And so nobody, nobody stands before God and says, look how straight is my walk. What we say is, look where my walk takes place. Do you realize that people who walk in darkness are blind to their own faults? They're deceived by their own abilities. They may have good days. They may have bad days. They may have good moments. They may have bad moments. But if your way of life is outside of Christ, then all your deeds are done in the dark. But what about those who walk in the light? Those whose daily walk is in Jesus. If your chosen way of life is to follow the master, your walk is in the light. So think of two circles, two chosen paths. One is a daily walk in the light of Christ, and one is a daily walk in darkness. If your walk is in Christ, you may have good days, you may have bad days, you may have good moments, you may have bad moments. But if your way of life is inside of Christ, then God pronounces you in the light. That means that my stumblings take place in the light. My failings take place in the light. My righteousness, like filthy rags, can be found in the light of Christ, and that's my hope. I don't call in grace, I don't fall in grace, then out of grace, in grace, then out of grace, a hundred times a day. As long as I'm living a confessional life in the Messiah, my daily walk, the good and the bad, takes place in the light. The last thing I want you to notice is this verse in this verse is the word cleanses. That's a present active indicative. Now, we've got to be very careful in putting too much weight on Greek tenses. One of my favorite professors and friends is sitting just a few seats back from here. Dwayne Warden has his Greek Bible with him, which is always intimidating. And he'll tell you. My Greek teacher in undergrad said, when you take two or three semesters of Greek, you know just enough to be dangerous. It's like somebody who wants to learn the English language, so they memorize the dictionary. Well, think of how many words you use in a normal conversation that don't really fit the dictionary definition of the word. It's the same with tenses. The present active indicative can mean, I am running track. Now think about all the ways I am running track which is a present active indicative, can be understood. It can mean I'm on the track team and I run track from time to time. Or it could mean I run track all the time. Or it could mean I am right now running track. Can't you tell from my loss of breath? Tense alone won't tell you which of those is true, but context can help you know which of those is true. And I think the context suggests the last of those. As long as we are living a confessional life, as long as we are walking in the light, the blood of Jesus continually cleanses us from all sin. That means the blood of Jesus that you and I contacted in baptism keeps flowing, washing us clean, renewing our faith, and keeping our sins from being placed on our account. When you feel so bad about something you did today, something beneath you, not in keeping with the character of Christ, and you go to him in prayer and you say, dear father, I'm not the man or the woman I want to be. I need you to fix me and make me better. 
I'm not worthy to be called your son. The father looks at you and says, I, I've got the book of life open, my dear, precious child. I see no sin on your account. I see my son. I see the spotless lamb and you are in my son. And I count his righteousness as your righteousness. Do you know the name James A. Harding? Big school across the street named after him. He preached a sermon that was reprinted in 1898. It must have been one of his best. It was put together in a book of great sermons of the day. And in one of those sermons, he said this. Let no man comfort himself with the reflection that he who does right will be saved. For no man in the church or out of it does right. Have you ever heard the name R.L. Whiteside? Whiteside was so conservative, the leading light of the non-institutional group called Whiteside the best Bible student in our movement. Do you know what Whiteside said? Grace does not demand perfect obedience. We are saved by Christ, not by perfect obedience. Ever heard the name David Lipscomb? Lipscomb was friends with James Harding venerate preacher, editor of the Gospel Advocate. He was known far and wide as the Bible Answer Man. I know that because he wrote two books called Questions and Answers. Literally, the Bible Answer Man. But in the pages of the Gospel Advocate, he was asked, how do I know I'm saved? What's my assurance of pardon? How do we know that God's forgiven us? And he wrote this. We must strive to walk in the steps of Jesus and so grow into the likeness of God. But with our best efforts to serve God, we will often fall short of doing his will. We are human. And never a day passes that a man can say, this day, I've done my full duty. We fall short. We make wrong steps. We are frail and imperfect. When we've done the best we can, we must be saved. By the mercy and love of God. His grace is sufficient for us, but we never reach the point that we don't need His grace to save us. It was a blessed thing for humanity that Jesus gave the example of the two men that went up into the temple to pray, and the assurance that the publican who stood afar off and would not even lift up so much as his eyes to heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner went down to his house justified rather than the other, the self-righteous, self-sufficient Pharisee who felt that he possessed all the virtues. God's grace is revealed to our faith as sufficient to have all who continually strive to serve God, to do his will despite the weaknesses and frailties of humanity that cause men to fall short of perfect obedience. What God requires is to be like Jesus and having no will but our own, but a constant, earnest desire to do just what he requires. Sometimes at a funeral, you might overhear someone say, Joe was a good one. If he doesn't get into heaven, nobody will. And it's a nice sentiment to speak of the good actions of a person who put Christ first, but it's bad theology. No one, no one will be with God because they were good enough. And God doesn't grade on a curve. You're all bad, but Joe's pretty good, so Joe's the standard now. No. Joe is going to be with God because Jesus Christ paid the penalty for his sins. Putting so much emphasis on my ability to toe the line as the basis of my assurance is misguided. Because at the end of the day, whether the Lord comes back during my glorious 10-day sinless streak or even in the middle of my confessional prayer, my only defense is to be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own, but that which is through faith in Christ. Remember this, John wrote to inspire joy. Verse 4 of chapter 1 says, I'm writing this so that joy will fill the room. I want you to enjoy this, says John. Joy about fellowship. Joy about a God who knows we're dust, who knows we're sin. Joy that in spite of the fact that we sin, confessing that we have sin, rejoicing that Jesus is our advocate when we do sin. 
John ends his book in chapter 5 and verse 13 with a verse that needs to be needle pointed and put on a pillow on your couch or somewhere by the front door. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Read that again slowly. Savor every word. Remember the story that I mentioned at the beginning where a man said to me, do you, do you think you're the only ones going to heaven and we're supposed to say, well, not all of us are going to make it? I know what that godly man meant. He meant that our trust and security does not emanate from the name on a sign. He meant having your name on a church roll is not the same thing as having your name in the book of life or living in the kingdom of God. Simon the magician, you remember the story, was a church member who wanted to buy the power of the Spirit with money. And so Peter said to him, if you go on like this, you and your money are going to perish together. I, I know what he meant now that I'm older. But you know what I heard. You know what people hear when they hear things like that. What they hear is a doubling down. You know what? You want to know the most insecure people in the world? It's people who think that heaven belongs to the small group that gets everything right. Because it won't be too long before you begin to look in the mirror and wonder, is that going to include me? When someone says, if you die tonight, do you know where you would spend eternity? And you say, well, I, I don't know. I hope I do, but you can never tell. I might mess up between prayers. We'd have to change our song from blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, to somewhat assurance, some of the time. Can you imagine knocking on a door with that nervous, worried look on our faces and saying, how would you like to become a Christian? Why would I want to do that? Uh, so you can have the peace and joy that I've got. Doesn't look to me like you've got much of that. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. It's because I'm scared to death that I haven't done enough. Excuse me, it's been five minutes since my last prayer. I'm probably out of grace. I need to go re-up, and I'll be right back at the door. John writes his letter to Christians like you and me. He writes to people who sin like you and me. He writes to people who lie if they say they have no sin like you and me. And he says, I write these things to you, to you who have put your trust in the Son of God that you might know that you have, not will have, not hope to have, not might have, that you possess right now the life of eternity, the blessed life in Jesus Christ that you're living now and is going to continue through the ages. I'm giving you hope, says John. Just like he said back in chapter 2 and verse 12, I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. We know that a child of God can walk away from God. The Bible says that. But it's not the case that in our efforts to try to please him, when we stumble, when we have a false start, we don't quite measure up, and we wonder if he's forgotten us. I promise you the answer is he has not. John's drawing assurance from the same place Paul drew assurance in Philippians 3, that my hope, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. You, you with all your spiritual warts, you, the one praying every night, God, I'm not who I want to be, but I trust in you. You and your struggling, you and your stumbling, you with your confessional life, you who trust in Jesus and not in your own strength. It's proof to the world that you've chosen Christ's life as the model for your own and God sees you, not in your sin, but in your Savior. Know that you have eternal life. I know God is faithful, and it's not the job of a preacher to preach anybody into heaven or to preach them into hell. But I wish, I wish that in that Wednesday night Bible class, when the speaker said, suppose somebody sins and then dies, what do you think God is going to do with that man? I wish that that good man in the back had yelled out, I don't know what the Lord is going to do, but I know this, there is no one who can be trusted more with this than Jesus Christ. 
He's the one who stands right now at the right hand of the Father interceding for him. He's the God who knows our struggles with sin. He's the one this deacon has talked to every day of his life. He's the one who's going to be faithful to what he promised. He's the one who will make his judgment as one with a proven track record of grace and mercy. The God who loved me at my worst and called me when I offered him absolutely nothing. That's the God who's in care of his soul. It's the same God who's in care of my soul. And I trust him. Would to God that we'd sleep better at night knowing the answer to the question. I just wonder if I've done enough. The answer is absolutely not. But Jesus did enough. And praise God for that.